in the Middle Ages, making it to sainthood was a tedious process, but being murdered in the Canterbury Cathedral was a good starting point. Welcome to the Medieval Grad Podcast, brought to you by Medievalist.net. It's a podcast where we meet graduate students and early career researchers to learn about the new trends and the future of research in medieval studies. I'm Lucie Lemonnier, a medieval historian and the podcast host. Today, we're talking with Tristan Taylor, a PhD candidate in English at the University of Saskatchewan under Dr. Yin Lu. Hello, Tristan. Thank you very much for being here. Hey, Lucy. First, tell us what brought you to the Middle Ages. My entrance into the Middle Ages is not a novel one. Uh, I came to it in my undergrad through Chaucer, as I'm sure many of us have. I had a, a really incredible professor uh, where I was doing my undergrad who kind of took me under her wing and showed me what medieval literature could be. And I, I really liked how Middle English was just on the periphery of what was understandable. And it was a novel experience being able to read a different language without actually needing to study a different language. And of course, Chaucer is hilarious at times. Uh, and through Chaucer, I experienced all of the Arthuriana, But from there, I really expanded and I discovered Julian of Norwich and the mysticisms, uh, or rather the, the mystical writers. And then I, I worked backwards into, into Old English, though now I am firmly in the Middle English period. Thank you. Your dissertation is titled Genre Hybridization in the South English Legendaries, Life of Thomas Beckett. The title seems a little bit mysterious at first glance. So with your permission, Tristan, let's unpack. First, what are the South English legendaries? So the South English legendaries are a collection of, of texts, uh, stories about saints and biblical histories, or sanctorale and temporale, uh, composed in the 13th century. They were continuously reproduced until the 16th century, uh, and there is even some evidence that they were copied well into the 17th century. The title South English Legendary is a modern one. The scholar who produced the first edition of it, uh, Carl Horseman, titled it as the early South English Legendary. And the title is a purely utilitarian one. Uh, it never circulated as the South English Legendary in the Middle Ages. It's called the South English Legendary because, well, the text originates in the south of England. It's, in, it's composed in English and it's a legendary. There are readings uh, meant for religious communities. Legendary is coming from the Latin to read, uh, legende, and so these would be texts, or they are texts that are meant to be consumed by the pious. Uh, they are meant to be edifying, so these would be sources of sermon material for uh, friars or any really itinerant priest. But they would also be kind of entertaining stories that you would hear uh, over dinner or in, in taverns. How were they entitled in the Middle Ages? Did they have a title? Yeah, so there were a few different titles. Uh, many of them actually just went untitled. But more often than not, when they were given a title, they were just called Legenda Aurea. So they were really much uh, drawing or being compared to, even in the, the Middle Ages, uh, compared to um, Jacobus de Vorgenay's Legenda Aurea. What's really interesting is that Only in a few circumstances do the titles actually acknowledge the, the Englishness of the collection. And it is a remarkably English collection of texts. It uh, emphasizes English saints. Uh, it has uh, baronial sympathies. Um, it's produced at the same time that Simon de Montfort is, is uh, running amok. And there's a lot of really pro-English sentiment Uh, in the collection, which I think is also one of the uh, more compelling features of the collection. Okay. I was wondering kind of the number of texts we have that are kind of originals from the 13th century versus the copies. I read, I think somewhere maybe on the British Library website that there are maybe 60 manuscripts uh, right now or maybe more. So I was wondering, you know, the distribution in time of the copies versus maybe the originals. Yes, of course. So the, the earliest extant witness that we have is found in the Bodleian Library in Laud Miscellany 108. It contains 64 texts. Uh, I call them SEL texts because of how the SEL was composed. Uh, it, 
is a very rigid structure. And so it's, uh, as one scholar, Manfred Gorlach, uh, calls it easily imitable. But by later periods, so well into the, uh, the 14th and 15th century, we have witnesses like uh, Bodley 779, which contains 143 texts. So it's clear that it has a very complex textual tradition. I've discovered at least 72 manuscripts. It's the third most popular Middle English religious text. So the general consensus is, is that there's no one poet, uh, that the text was so easily imitable that you just had people adding to it. And it the, the collection just grew by accretion through the centuries to a point where uh, it's really hard to differentiate what is and is not a part of the SEL, since every single manuscript is unique in its truest sense of the word as a manuscript is unique, but no witness contains the exact same text in the exact same arrangement. So there are very specific sources of evidence for reading practices of individual communities. Hmm, that's interesting. All right, let's go back to your dissertation and to the unpacking process. Tell us who Thomas Beckett was, although of course the name might be familiar to many of us, but the details might not necessarily be. So would you give us a gist of the character and the reason why his life ended up in legendaries? So Thomas Beckett was the son of Norman immigrants. He was born in London around 1120, and he had a pretty quick rise to power. Uh, he studied very briefly in Paris, uh, but unceremoniously dropped out. And when he moved back to London, he started working in the, the commerce industry. He was a keeper of accounts for uh, a merchant named uh, Osbert Wheat Deners. Uh, it was there that he was connected to uh, the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop Theobald. And under Theobald, he became a deacon. It's then uh, that he caught the attention of Henry II, who befriended him. They became fast friends and they really enjoyed living the, the high life of hunting and hawking and, dare I say, womanizing and just really just being what we would expect from nobility. And so what's important about, or what's interesting, I suppose, about Thomas Beckett is his uh, rise to prominence considering his, his relatively humble birth. But of course, all good things have to come to an end. And uh, without going into the nitty gritty details of the legal disputes of the 12th century, there was a fracturing in how Henry and Thomas thought that the uh, legal code should function in England. Uh, Thomas Beckett, when he became archbishop, he rejected his role as chancellor that he had been appointed to under Henry II. And really, he thought that there should be a primacy of, of the church. And Henry II wanted to sort of consolidate power. There were a few trials, and Thomas eventually fled England for fear of his life, and he ended up living in uh, Normandy in France for uh, six years. So he was really only Archbishop in Canterbury for about two years. He eventually came back to England in 1170 uh, in December and was unceremoniously cut down in his own cathedral uh, December 29th, 1170 by four knights who were working or alleged to have been killing or alleged to have killed Thomas Beckett on behalf of Henry II. And it was really from that moment on that he became the most popular saint in England. And there, I think, is a case to be made about all of Europe. Thank you. Among the legends circulating about Thomas Beckett is the very peculiar story of his father and his mother's romance, a romance set in the Holy Land, where Thomas' mother is described as a Saracen. Tell us a little bit about that particular story and what it tells us about the cultural construction of sainthood. So this is one of my favorite stories. Uh, and I write a lot about this in my dissertation because I think the way that this legend functions uh, has so much to do with how medieval uh, audiences liked to engage with, with myth building and, and with their own literary culture. So the, the romance, I like to call it a romance of, of Gilbert and Alessandra, 
takes place as a sort of prelude to Thomas Beckett's life proper. But as the story goes, uh, Gilbert is the, the Norman merchant who pilgrimages to the Holy Land, gets captured by uh, a Saracen lord named Amarod. He gets thrown in prison with all of his men. Eventually, the Amarod's only daughter, Alessandra in the story, Matilda in real life, uh, falls in love with Gilbert. Uh, Gilbert teaches her about Christianity, about London, about himself, and he persuades Alessandra to let him escape by pledging his love to her. He escapes in the middle of the night, abandoning Alessandra, and travels back to London, and Alessandra goes through great lengths, only knowing one English word, that is London, uh, and ends up finding him uh, in the center of London, and she, be, uh, she gets baptized, they get married, and then that same night they conceive Thomas. So what's really interesting about this story is that it amplifies the, the rise to power that Thomas Beckett had. So not only was he just the son of Norman immigrants uh, with no noble claim, no real power, but rather his mother was a Saracen. So there's the sort of the other that's built into the story. And it's that other that we find in other Middle English romances like Havelock or King Horn. So I think the story and why it's so important is that it's a threshold through which audiences can begin to engage with the idea of sanctity and with religious literature in, in general. Uh, the story originates from one of uh, Thomas Beckett's earliest hagiographers, Edward Grimm. He was witness to the, uh, the martyrdom and actually had his arm cut uh, defending the first blow. So he's the originator of the story. It gets passed down through the Latin literary tradition into the South English legendary. And it's in the South English legendary where it functions as its own text. So it has all of the hallmarks of its own text. It is identified by its own like mise en page. Uh, it has its own signatures. It is in its essence, its own text. Uh, and there are two versions of it that circulated with the SEL. So I think the poet, when he includes this story, isn't just including it because it's part of the Thomas Beckett literary tradition. He's including it as a rhetorical effect. He is saying, this is a story that is emblematic or typical of a different type of genre, uh, namely romance. And I'm going to use it to introduce to you this other character that you should know about, Thomas Beckett. And so a lot of the characteristics of Gilbert and Alessandra are modeled for Thomas Beckett. So we see a lot of Thomas Beckett's preoccupation with the Virgin Mary comes from Alessandra. The, a lot of the idea of traveling that takes place in Thomas Beckett's legend also originates in the the romance of Gilbert and Alessandra. Yeah, it's very interesting, and um, I think it you, you you kind of started to introduce us to what genre genre hybridization <laughs> means. I'm sorry for the awful <laughs> pronunciation, but you show that this the romance style or archetype is also included in a more traditional life of saint. Um, is that what it means? Like different styles of writing kind of coming together to create original or more engaging stories? Yes. So genre hybridization is as, almost as boring as it sounds. <laughs> uh, it's, it's literally just the combination of multiple genres into one. Alistair Fowler describes it as having two or more genres that none of which are more dominant than any of the others. So there's an implication that there's an equal treatment of all the genres. And so I'm interested in genre because I think that genre can be used rhetorically. Uh, I think you can make arguments using genre. You can tell the same story in different ways and get different audience reactions. Uh, for example, uh, Charles Dickens includes the what I call the romance of Gilbert and Alessandra in his children's history of the English, uh, of, of England, rather. So I think that's really interesting. But he introduces it as once upon a time, there was a Norman merchant named Gilbert. So the way that stories are told impact how we engage with them. And of course, I'm not claiming that that is a novel idea. So 
When I talk about genre hybridization in the South English Legendary, and in particular with Thomas Beckett, I think there was a very deliberate attempt by the poet of the SEL to incorporate a whole lot of different genres to try and popularize a set of texts. So we don't just see a very traditional edifying hagiographical tradition which follows the life of a saint and includes a, a passion and a martyrdom and then miracles. What we get is in the life of Saint Michael, part three, we get a pseudoscientific treatise about astronomy. Um, when it comes to Thomas Beckett, in a recent conference, I argued that he's presented as a knight, which is interesting because he's very rarely portrayed as being martial in history. Uh, the historical scholarship doesn't portray uh, Thomas Beckett as ever having held a sword. He led an army, allegedly, of 700 knights in the Siege of Toulouse. In, uh... So, like, there's these aspects of, of Thomas Beckett's character uh, that lend themselves to genre hybridization. And uh, Paul Brown, in his dissertation from forever ago, defined Thomas Beckett as being tripartite. He is part religious icon, part historical figure, and part myth. Um, I kind of reframe that as being like a literary Thomas Beckett. And so those types of Beckett, those archetypes uh, of perception of how we look at Thomas Beckett, map onto medieval genres really, really neatly. So we have the religious Beckett maps onto the more traditional hagiographical sources, uh, the more mythological and literary maps onto romance, and the... Uh, the historical figure really maps onto medieval historical writing. And, I mean, all of those medieval genres use the exact same vocabulary. There's something really interesting going on with the genre. So it's not as if the poet was just writing a bunch of different genres for fun. I argue uh, that he's trying to popularize a set of texts by making the text as accessible as possible for as wide of an audience as possible. And I think that's a justifiable claim considering it's, what, like the third most extant Middle English text, and it is popular in all senses of the word. It is written in the vernacular. Um, it is written and enjoyed by the popular people. So there's a whole lot going on with genre hybridization that... I think speaks to not only how medieval authors approached writing, but also how readers actually enjoyed consuming literature. Thank you, Tristan. Last but not least, uh, I'd like to conclude the podcast with a very specific question. What advice would you give to a prospective graduate student wanting to do a PhD in medieval literature? So that's a good question. I think the most important thing that I learned in my PhD so far. And the most applicable skill set that I've learned, or the, I guess, the elevator pitch of why medieval literature is important, is that we study it in an attempt to dispossess ourselves of the notions that the medieval period is foreign. But a, a lot of the ideas that we uncover are still very much represented in modern times. So, I have a, a colleague who, who likes to think that I work on highfalutin literature, and I like to kindly remind him that I work on the equivalent of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the 13th century. <laughs> like, there's very real parallels between superheroes and saints. I mean, they're both intercessors. They're both, in many ways, supernatural. I think the Middle Ages has a lot to offer uh, our society, our, our culture. Uh, I like to teach... Uh, the Dream of the Rude to my first year English students, because they are still very much in the mindset, or many of them are still very much in the mindset of the Middle Ages as being this period of scientific regression and, and ignorance, and it's, it's the Dark Ages. But then I present them with a poem about a personified cross describing its own experience at the crucifixion of Jesus, and it kind of flips their understanding of what is possible and there is a real novelty to the Middle Ages, but the Middle Ages or literature in the Middle Ages really speaks to a lot of the issues that we're talking about now. Uh, one thing that I'm interested in is about how 
scholars communicate their research to a broader public. And I think this is a, a pretty appropriate setting to discuss this. But when we think about uh, scientists working in labs and then they have a discovery and then the media catches on to something and they have their pithy headline and then they have to backtrack because the newspaper article didn't actually cover precisely what the scientific discovery actually was. So it's just an, an issue with public relations and communication. But Julian in Norwich did that. In her Revelations of Divine Love, she she domesticated continental Latin theology and she drew on all of the, the, the famed theologians and instead of mathematical and geometrical diagrams and esoteric terminology, she referred to things in terms of what people understood, like hazelnuts and gardens. And there's a lesson that can be learned there. So I think that what I would advise someone who's interested in studying a PhD in medieval literature is that absolutely go for it uh, and, and take what you read from that period and apply it to the to our to our period. And there's a there's a lot of really fascinating parallels that are I don't think yet fully explored. Thank you very much, Tristan. And thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been a, a real treat. That was Tristan Taylor, a PhD candidate at the University of Saskatchewan. You can find Tristan's info in the show notes. Stay with us because the episode isn't over yet. Let's bring in Peter Konichny from Medievalist.net. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? What did you think of the show? Hey, I'm doing good. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I was uh, really surprised about this South English legendaries. I, I didn't know it was a bestseller. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> when we say like it, there was 72 manuscripts, that's a huge amount. If that was all of Europe, that would be like, wow, this is this is something that really uh, a lot of people read just because you have to think of all the manuscripts that have you know disappeared over the time. Like this is what's kind of just remains. And yeah, like. I can see why it was really popular. Like, I love this story he was telling uh, about, you know, Alessandra. And the only word she knows is London. <laughs> yeah, which is not really a, a word. It's kind of a name place. So it's not even it, practical. Yeah. Like, if you want to eat, you cannot say London, London. Nobody else yeah, can yeah, help yeah. you. And, you know, Thomas Beckett is always a, a topic. It's been historians have been talking about it ever since his murder murdered him. So it's, he's been a popular figure. Yeah. What I was really interested about is the, the fact that over the 72 manuscripts, there are not two identical manuscripts because it's really medieval texts were so alive, so to speak. Like each um, writer or scribe who would add his own spin or add a new story. So it's kind of a collection of disparate texts that are connected somehow, but are still different. This dimension of the, the interview I was really interested in. And also the way in which uh, scribes or writers would use different genres to talk to an audience and engage a different mm -hmm. audience. So let's do kind of chanson de geste or an epic story to, to hook them in. Or let's do maybe a romance so that they will listen more closely. That, that was very, very interesting. The way in which you can mm -hmm. kind of put a spin on, a, on an original yeah. story to keep the readers engaged, especially non-clerical readers, like people in a tavern or... I really, I found it very interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems to me like these texts are for like the wider audience, right? Like it's this is not something that's just read in a monastery, but uh, it's it's seeking, uh, you know, to get people interested in, I guess, in Beckett in a way. But like, I guess almost Beckett kind of serves as a gateway into learning about other the all these things. So yeah, um, like it always surprises me how, how popular Beckett's you know, sainthood was like, as soon as he dies, he kind of immediately becomes so much more important, you know, uh, like in Obi-Wan Kenobi type of thing. <laughs> Stri strike me down and I'll become more powerful than you can ever imagine. Everyone is kind of putting all this, these takes on Beckett, right? And, and that's how like, I guess this, you know, legendaries kind of forms, right? It's like, here are all the stories because, you know, there's a lots of things happening with Beckett. Uh, and, and it and is uh, like sainthood, like especially like end of uh, end of twelfth century, thirteenth century. It really is, you know, a huge, huge deal. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I thought it was really quite good. 
Do you have any pieces on medievalist.net or any podcast looking either at saints' lives in general or Thomas Beckett in particular? They, I would say, like there, there's a lot of things happening just because this is the anniversary of his death. Uh, right now, there's a, a big of, uh, exhibition at the British Museum. Mm. So you know, uh, so even if you're listening to it after this exhibition is over, there's still going to be quite a lot of kind of Beckett related material going uh, out. And yeah, please, yeah, check out the website. You can see, you know, like. It's just like the beautiful art uh, and, and, and materials that have been created like uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, just about, about uh, Beckett and his martyrdom. Yeah, we'll make sure to check it out. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks. You are listening to the Medieval Grad Podcast brought to you by Medievalist.net. If you want to support us and this podcast, you can subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com slash medievalists. You can get a lot of very neat benefits on Patreon, including being able to hear these episodes early. We love doing this show and we really appreciate your help. I'm Lucie Lemonnier. You can find me on Instagram. My handle is at the French Medievalist. And you can also look me up on academia.edu. Thank you for tuning in. Goodbye. Au revoir.